given to me before the end of day, Friday before the eclipse. I'll take them in for you and get them canceled. So, send out an email reminder. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that kind of a mass. Okay, before email. Friday? Yeah. Before yeah. Friday? Yes, yeah, so okay. okay. Oh, excellent. Okay. And it's a cool stamp. I have no doubt. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. But now we're ready to start. And thanks everyone for coming. We are lucky today to have with us Sifan Kahale. Very recently moved to the Oregon coast from Maui. You might ask why. That's another question, another discussion. Um, CFAN's been involved very, very much in astronomy for many years, and specifically the uh, Pan Star Observatory at Maui and other places. And she will talk to us a bit about the wonders of the eclipse. So, for those of you that have been dealing with the location of porta potties and garbage cans and all that, this is the real. Eclipse we're talking about here. This is the good stuff. So, see, fan, take off. Thank you so much. Well, hello. I thought what I would do before I started is just show what this looks like from space. I was able, I found this just a couple days ago. And this was taken by a Japanese spacecraft. It's in geosynchronous orbit, which means it's looking at one place at the Earth that's rotating with the Earth. And um, what you see, a couple things here. First of all, you see the sun's uh, reflection going across the ocean, but then you see the moon channel. <laughs> so that's what the eclipse looks like in space. Now this is 24 hours, so it's a sort of sped up so we can see it and not stay here all forever to look at it. But you get a feeling for what's happening. The, the moon's shadow is going to be moving at 2,400 miles an hour. So if you think you're going to stand up on a tall hill and watch it coming towards you, <laughs> if you're up on a, in a, in a, uh, a jet or something far away, so you can get the perspective, you know, then you'd be able to see it moving across. But it's going to come at you very, very fast and linger very fast. So that just gives you a little perspective. It's pretty, pretty cool. Now there's a couple of things here that I'm going to um, uh, just, <laughs> j just sort of pose a question that I'll answer a little bit later, but you notice a couple things. Um, the sun is coming across this way, or its reflection, but the moon's shadow is going that way. Isn't the eclipse when the moon is in front of the sun? So how can we see those two things going on? Now, I won't go into too much science, I promise, and I'll stay completely away from math, so we're safe. <laughs> but I will try and explain some of this for you, as well as a couple other conundrums. So with that, uh, let's see if not. That is a total eclipse. You block the sun's rays. Its atmosphere, the chronosphere, is what comes out when you're able to see it. The sun itself is probably 10 to 20,000 times brighter than its chromosphere, and that's why you normally don't see this. But this is one of the spectacular things that you'll see during totality. And a couple of things that you can sort of pick out here, too, is uh, right around the edge, uh, and I'll show you another picture, too, where you can see some prominences, and normally they'll be like red flickers of flame that are coming off the uh, surface. And we might be lucky to be able to see some of those too. So let's see. The naked eye? Pardon? With the naked eye? Yes. It was a little bit difficult with the naked eye. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that too. You know, some of the things that you can do to maybe remove those out. Okay, now I have to go back and find it. So this is the presentation. And again, my name is Sifan Kahali. I'm a Hokuahine. That means a star and woman, or astronomer, okay, in Hawaii. And so, aloha, ekumone. 
Now, if you're living in deep Bay, I'm sorry. It's no eclipse. It's been it's been canceled. The state of California has been canceled. Something about the whales, and they're going to have glasses big enough, and they're going to be confused, and you know, a mess in there. So they decided they're going to cancel the eclipse until such a time that they can figure this out. So I'm sorry, but you need to go someplace else. Now, the key thing that I left off of this is right up here, and that's the date. It's April 1st. <laughs> so when I saw this, I thought, oh, what better thing to start off this talk with. <laughs> okay. So this is our neighborhood star. One of the questions uh, I, we always put on uh, the Star 101 uh, question, uh, test, the first test is, what is our nearest star? And everybody goes, Proxima Centauri. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. No, it's the sun. The sun nearest. It's a star. Now, this is some of the stuff that's going on around the star that we normally don't see. And again, that's because it's so bright. So normally, uh, this washes out everything else. But once the moon covers the sun, all of that light is blocked, and now we can see its atmosphere, the corona. And these are some of the huge things that are going on out there. Just as an example, I'd say this dot right here, that's the size of the Earth. A hundred Earths can be stacked next to each other to go completely across the sun. So when you see some of this, uh, some of this action that's going on here, coronal mass ejections, flares, prominences, these things are 10, 20, to 50 times the size of the Earth. These are being blown off into the interstellar space. This is space weather that affects us, you know, that comes down and, and, and hits the Earth, and what we have to be careful with. And um, light from the sun, so when something happens and we have a flare, but light from that flare will reach us seven to eight seconds later. Material like this, the solar wind that's being blown off, that takes two and a half days to reach us. So that's sort of good news because we can see these things happen with the flares and the electromagnetic energy that's given off. And then we can count two and a half days and we can take action on Earth to protect ourselves you know, from that. And that includes, for instance, anytime you have a long wire, you have this electromagnetic radiation coming in that'll induce currents and electricity in those wires. So over uh, uh, charge our grids and things like this. Power companies watch this weather, the space weather, and reduce their capacities or what's carrying on that line to account, you know, for this, uh, this you know, for these electromagnetic uh, charges and things coming in. This also is what creates the aurora borealis. Remember two weeks ago, we were supposed to see the aurora borealis down here? Did anybody? I didn't see it. No. That was because of an M6 flare uh, that happened about two weeks ago. And I'll show you it. I, I saved the uh, images for what happened at, at that time. So, just a couple other looks. We have a sunspot out right now. You can see it down over here. Now, when you look at this, it's actually going to be turned around, so it'll be on the other side, because it's like a mirror image through telescopes type of a thing. And a sunspot is a place where uh, magnetic fields Instead of going around, like we have on the Earth, it comes out of the uh, North Pole, goes down to the South Pole. Well, in the Sun, what happens is that uh, the center, the equator of the Sun, is moving faster uh, than the other parts of the Sun. That's because it's a big gas ball. It's not solid like the, like the Earth. So when that happens, these magnetic lines of fields are caught in that gas, and they start to twist around at the equator. That's what gives us the 11-year sunspot cycle. So at about 11, it takes about 11 years for these to really twist up. And then they all let go and you have a lot of sunspots. What happens is some of these are brought in and then instead of coming around like this, they actually come out of the surface of the sun and make big loops. Where they come out, the area in the middle there is actually cooler than the rest of the sun. It's only 50,000 degrees instead of 70,000 degrees. <laughs> well, 20,000 degrees cooler, that's, that's a lot cooler. <laughs> and that's what makes the sunspot. 
and you can see this yellow flocula that's around it, or the orange sort of area, that's the magnetic lines of force taking this material out, you know, out uh, around it. Now the problem is, magnetic fields don't like to do that. <laughs> that's pretty bad. And so they, they, what will happen, especially down below, they come together and then they fan out. Okay, and they make a big long arch. Material from the sun uh, follows that and is grabbed and all of that. Well, this part that's down here wants to come together and it'll twist. And when that happens, this entire loop disintegrates and goes out. That's a huge explosion. And all this material that was caught in it gets thrown out into space. And that's a CME. And that's what happened two weeks ago. And that material then, two and a half days later, hits the Earth, you know, that follows our many clients of force through. And when it comes back through the atmosphere, it lights up the uh, atoms and molecules that are in upper atmosphere. So greens and blues and oranges and reds, those are oxygen, nitrogen, etc., that are being lit up. It's the same thing that happens with fluorescent lights. So it's that much energy that's coming through the atmosphere, it's all from the sun. So, this is taken at a different wavelength. This is taken at an iron, uh, I think, iron 26 line. That means it's the iron atom that has, uh, in this case, about 12 electrons removed from it. That's very difficult to do. Atoms love their electrons. <laughs> you might be able to take one or two away, but to take that many takes a lot of energy. How much? 1.4 million degrees. So this is looking at light that is from atoms that are 1.4 million degrees that are uh, outside here. It tells us something about what's going on at the sun. And you can see we have a very active location here. And if you look over the white light, that's where our sunspot is. <coughs> and iron, you know, is magnetic, right? So it makes sense. So you can almost take a look here, and you can see the loops of magnetic field, the magnetic loops there. A little bit about what's going on. Now, watch over here. There's going to be a huge explosion. This metal piece here is, uh, this is about where the sun is. And they put an occulting disk here to, so the light of the sun isn't so bright, so that we can see. There it goes. You see that? Now look how large that was compared to the sun. So remember how many Earths could be fit across the sun? That is huge. That's a lot of material that just got blown off to space. And if the sun is rotating just right, and it lets us off, not when it's directly facing the Earth, but just before, then that sweeps across us. And that's part, this is, by the way, from the M M6 flare that, uh, that occurred. So this is why people were thinking that we might have not only an aurora borealis, but a large enough one that we'd be able to see all the way down here. Now the next one is, so that's the material going out. The next one is the flare itself. The electric, there it goes. Do you see that? A huge flash? Now that flash was probably about uh, 40 to 50 times more bright than the entire sun at that split second. It's so bright that it overwhelmed uh, our satellites. But that's the flare itself. That's the electromagnetic energy that's released you know, when those magnetic coils touched. And then the rest of the material was thrown off into space. So just a bit of an appreciation for what we're dealing with up there. So with that, let's go and talk a little bit more about eclipses. I put 1919 down here because this was a very important one. <clears throat> this is really what um, um, saved Einstein's bacon, let's put it that way. <laughs> Up until this point, um, you know, he was, he was coming out and saying, well, in, in space, light can be bent if it comes next to a mass, curvature of space time, and these kind of things. And that was just ridiculous. No way. You had light in a vacuum. There's nothing affecting it. You're telling me gravity is going to have something to do with light? No way. Can't happen. So he was basically ignored until this eclipse occurred. And what happened is that a number of scientists went out in 1919 before this particular eclipse. And a month before the eclipse, they went out. And there was a group of stars that uh, were going to partially be covered by the sun during the eclipse. 
So a month ahead of time, they went out and they very accurately measured the distance between all these different stars. And then they did that again uh, in, during the eclipse, because now the eclipse, and everything starts, you can see the stars again. Right? So they measured those stars that could still be seen, and then a month after the eclipse, they went back and, and remeasured all the, the different stars there. And sure enough, the stars that were closest to the sun's rim moved, or apparent moved, as light was bent. Suddenly, oh my gosh, Einstein was right. And that made a huge difference in physics and everything else from that day forward. But this was the first proof that really put him on the map. 1919. The first mentioned uh, eclipse was, and I can't remember the exact date, it was a thousand or so years BC. And it was over in China. And it wasn't so much that they mentioned the eclipse as much as they mentioned uh, these two astronomers that were put to death because they miscalculated the eclipse and the emperor was not happy. Apparently, the emperor was going to get all. Ta -da. Ta -da. Ta -da. Okay, where are my Who says astronomy is a safe uh, thing? That's <laughs> very dangerous. <laughs> okay. 1954, it came, uh, started in Nebraska, through Minnesota, Wisconsin, and uh, Upper Michigan, then into Canada. So it went sort of an angle like that. And that's the first one that I saw. Now, uh, it's dating me a little bit, but I was pretty small when I did that. <laughs> and my memories of it are, um, it's not too much, but it's a lot ago. But my family and my cousins, aunts and uncles, we all went up to Lac de Flambeau Floage, and everybody got a cabin next to each other on the Floage. So we had these log cabins back then that were staying on it. I remember being on the porch, making a pinhole camera. And uh, nobody else, you know, none of the other relatives are knew anything about this, but I had my little pinhole camera, so everybody had to come over by me. <laughs> so I'm pretty, so I remember that much. In 1979, how many of you saw the eclipse uh, in Northern Oregon here? Okay. That's another one that went sort of an angle up. It started in, in uh, just off the coast, went across the top of Oregon, uh, uh, Washington, a little bit of Montana, then off into uh, uh, Canada and, and up the way. In 2024, we're going to have another eclipse, uh, total eclipse. This is going to start in Canada and go basically almost north uh, across the eastern seaboard and up into uh, and go away up to Canada. So wait a second. The eclipse that we're having right now is sort of what you'd expect. It's going to go straight across. 79, it went on an angle up. 54, it went on an angle up. You know, sometimes it goes an angle down. What's going on? How come it's not always in the same place? I'd like you think about that. <laughs> okay. Some of the things that we discovered by eclipses. Well, a uh, long time ago, the Greeks were actually able to calculate the size of the moon and the size of the sun, and the distance to the moon and the distance to the sun. It's all using geometry <laughs> and angles, putting stakes to the ground, seeing wells, having people placed. You know, did you see it, did you not, when did it occur, etc. And then doing the math and figuring it out. So just with that really pretty basic, simple, simple if you know math, <laughs> you can figure this out yourself. This is something you can repeat today and still be able to figure this out. So during an eclipse, you can uh, put this, these type of calculations together. What's really amazing is that the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun. Exactly. And the sun is exactly 400 times further away. Now, when you put those two things together, that means from our point of view, the angular dimensions of these <coughs> are the same. 400 times further away, 400 times larger. That makes them both, from our perspective, exactly the same size. Now. We we're just talking at lunch too. If you uh, um, you ever see a uh, like a harvest moon, you know it's really huge on the horizon. I said, well, don't do this because it's going to completely destroy that image. But 
I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> if you hold your, your arm out at arm's length and look at your small fingernail, that's the size of the moon or the sun. And if you have one of these large moons, like a harvest moon, do that. It's the same size, so it's an optical illusion. It completely destroys the illusion. That's what I mean. You don't really want to do this, because I think it looks better the other way. But you that's, that's the size of it. Hmm? It will cover it up. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the size of the sun as well. So that's one of the problems in looking at the sun, say with glasses or something, is it's pretty small. And another big point that I'm going to make a couple times uh, today here is that um, you really don't want to do anything else, like take a selfie. Because <laughs> if the sun is only this large, and it's going to be black because the moon's in front of it, and you're going to try and find that in your cell phone, <laughs> Sorry. it's not going to happen. <laughs> and meanwhile, as I'll show you in a little bit here, time is going on. This is only two minutes long. So you're going to waste that time trying to figure this out. So one of the big things I want you to take away from here is don't do it. <laughs> Just be present. Just watch for all these different things that are going to happen, which I'm going to talk a little bit about here too. So uh, another thing that we found out was the corona was hot. Um, when you heat up things, like iron, you saw that other uh, photograph, it gives off this particular uh, type of light. In fact, what it is, is just lines of light, we call a spectrum. Okay. And every atom, and in every configuration of the atom, minus so many electrons, plus so many, etc., all give out very distinct patterns of these lines. It's like a fingerprint for an atom. That's how we know that's iron. Well, they found this fingerprint in the solar uh, corona. And they, it didn't match anything that we had here. So they thought they found a brand new element. And they called it, of course, coronium, after the corona of the sun. And that was cool. The guy was famous, a lot of hoopla and everything. And about 50 years later, some physicist came and wrecked it all. <laughs> he went, did the math and, and found out that, you know, if you took iron and took away 12 of the electrons from it, then you'd get the spectrum. And that's what this was. The next question is, what does it take to get rid of those many electrons from iron? 1.4 million degrees. So, we now know two things. The outer corona of the sun is about 1 to 2 million degrees. Remember what I said the surface of the sun was? 70,000 degrees? Aren't you supposed to get colder the further away you go from something? <laughs> so we went from a relatively cool, balmy 70,000 degrees up to 2 million? That's still a conundrum in science today. We think it has to do with the magnetism, the magnetic lines out there that's exciting this other material up to that, that type of temperature. But that's how we found out how hot the outer corona was is by looking at the spectrum, what we thought was a new element, turns out to be ordinary everyday iron at extreme temperatures. So that was pretty cool. Another one is that uh, the Earth is affected by solar wind. The CMEs, the, the solar material that's flying through space and hitting us, back then um, it was happening a lot in the telegraph lines. You'd have sparks, people were getting shocks, sometimes the telegraph would be going off and nobody was sending anything. Uh, and these were happening every now and then. Well, it turned out that during an eclipse, there was a CME, a large explosion of this matter that's coming through. Two and a half days later, all the telegraph lines and everything started acting up and shocking and, and, and going by themselves. And they could already figure out that, you know, a solar mass ejection is going to take two and a half days later. So here was the proof that these two things are connected together. And today, our spacecraft, our grid lines, and everything else that I was telling you about, we all have to take, uh, you know, effective measures to protect those, uh, either turn them off, go into different standby modes, reduce the grid capacities, etc. when one of these things go off, like they did two weeks ago. Um, helium. That's the first element that was ever discovered someplace other than Earth. Before we discovered it here on Earth, they discovered this by its spectrum in the sun, in the outer corona of the sun. 
So once they discovered it, it took them about 30 or 40 years to find it here on Earth. So that was one of the only ones to date that was ever found someplace else first, and then we came back here to the Earth and, and, and looked for it. Historic events, um, because if, if there is an eclipse that's mentioned during this, you know, then we can both say, you know, such and such happened five days after the eclipse. We can go back and very accurately calculate when that eclipse was. And now we can go back and date a lot of these types of records throughout history. That's exactly when they occurred, you know, because of the eclipse. And of course, the bending in space time and, and the bending by gravity. And that's the big thing that really put Einstein on the map. It made a big difference in it, but everything else uh, since then. <laughs> okay, so what is going on? Okay, in a very simplistic way, we have the Earth and the Sun, and the Moon comes between it, right? So you have a shadow that's given off by the Sun, and um, the inner shadow, which is the darkest point of the shadow, is called the umbra, and that's going to sweep across the Earth, and anybody that's in that particular path will see a total eclipse. Now you also have a shadow called the penumbra, which is going to form a much larger circle. And anybody within that circle is going to see a partial eclipse. They'll see only a part of the uh, uh, sun being covered by the moon. Whereas in a total eclipse, the entire moon is going to cover the sun. Now, why is this the simplistic case? In this situation, that would mean every time we had a new we had a new moon, the moon's in front of the, of the sun, right? We should have an eclipse. So we should have twelve eclipses every year. Do we have twelve eclipses every year? And not only that, look at how it's going across the Earth, more or less straight across at the equator. Well, we're having one way up here. <laughs> Florida is going to go like this. <laughs> A couple of years ago in Mexico, it went like this, <laughs> not straight across. So obviously, there's something wrong <laughs> with this picture. And the main thing is that the Earth's or the Moon's orbit is not in the same plane that we go around the Sun in. It's tilted. Okay. So that means that when uh, the Moon and Earth are over here on this side of the Sun. If the moon comes up this way to match, you know, the line between the sun, then we'll have an eclipse. But if it's over here, then the moon's going to be below or above. And so its shadow is going to go off into space, either above or below. Okay? So that's number one. So what this means is that there's only two times in a year that this can happen. One when it's exactly up and down over here, what we call the nodes, and the other is when it's back over here, the ascending node and the descending node. It's only twice a year that you could possibly have an eclipse. But we don't have an eclipse twice a year. <laughs> so what else is going on? Well, that's the plane of the orbit has to be matched up. The next thing that has to match up is you have to have the moon there. <laughs> at exactly the time that it's there. So you have another cycle that you have to take a look at, right? And then in addition to this, there isn't 12 lunar months in a year, right? The whole problem that the calendars had and everything, you know, it doesn't exactly match 12 lunar cycles in one Earth cycle around the moon, around the sun. <laughs> okay, so that is, makes it so that it's not every twice a year, but it's now every maybe one and a half years that you can have that. And then there's another problem. You ever heard of the super, super moon? Right? And if you have a super moon, then obviously you must have a time when the moon is smaller. So what's happening there? Well, the orbit of the uh, moon, in fact, most orbits, they're not circles. They're ellipses. 
So at some point, the moon is much closer to us, and other points is further away in the orbit. Now, if it's closer to us, it looks larger, so it's going to cover the sun. Most of the cases, it's further out, so it doesn't quite cover the sun. And when it comes right in the center of the sun for an eclipse, you have a ring of sun still showing through. You know, a donor of the sun is such that's called an annular eclipse. So, you've got the sun, you've got the earth going around the sun, you've got the moon at an angle, you've got the moon going in and out in its orbit. You've got two places where you could possibly have an eclipse. <laughs> you've got to have the moon at that point when you have an eclipse. That point has got to be one of the super moons when it's closer, so it completely fills to get a you know, totality. And there's a few other cycles here, too. <laughs> so when you start doing the math <laughs> and you add all these things together, all these cycles, you come out what's called with the Seros cycle. This is back in the Greece, Greek times. They figure this out. It's about 186 to 188 years when it should repeat itself, when a particular spot on the Earth should see another eclipse. <laughs> OK. It's a mess. <laughs> all of these different cycles all coming together is why we only have an eclipse now and then. OK, that's all. We can relax. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so for us, the eclipse is going to last about two minutes, just slightly, a couple seconds less than two minutes. It's going to start at about 16 minutes after 10. That's totality. That's when we have everything completely blacked. And that's the point where you can take off the safety glasses and actually look you know, at, the, uh, uh, at the sun. <clears throat> it's going to be moving at 2,400 miles an hour. So like I was saying before, you're not going to see this coming. It goes pretty fast. Now, one place that might uh, have, might be pretty cool to see this would be Madras, just north of Bend. Because in Madras, exactly to the west of it, you have Mount Jefferson. So you'll see Mount Jefferson go black seconds before it comes over you. <laughs> so that would be pretty awesome, I think. However, there's also going to be an awful lot of people <laughs> is that the same in Salem except in reverse? So yes. they go black sex yes. factor. Yes. If you can see it from Salem. Uh, from my <laughs> sister's house. <laughs> now the entire eclipse goes from nine o'clock until eleven thirty. That three hours is basically the moon covering the sun and then afterwards not covering the sun. So the majority of the time is just uh, the eclipse in process. But totality is going to be at, uh, for us right here, 1015. Why they call this the Great Eclipse is because this is one of the first ones that goes so much over land. Usually it's mostly over water, you know, over the oceans. But this is going to cover uh, the entire United States, coast to coast. So they're expecting a lot of people uh, probably more people than ever to be able to come to that zone of totality to be able to watch this. So that's why it's called this. Um, and for us, it's uh, north of Pacific City down to Walport. Now, the only difference in, in, in this, that was, what's important here is to be between these two blue lines. That's the limits of totality. Anywhere within those blue lines, you're going to have a total eclipse. Only difference in here is the amount of time it's going to last for. At the center line, you'll have the maximum time. For us, that's just shy of two minutes. For Walport and, and Pacific City, we're probably talking a matter of uh, 20, 30 seconds. Now, however, this is not, um, not linear. So if you're in the center, you see the most. And um, if you go even maybe five miles uh, before Walport or uh, Pacific City, you will still have maybe a minute and a half, and then it falls off real quickly. So just in from that, you'll have a lot of time. But at the edges, it'll fall off and your time will go pretty fast. This is a pretty good diagram of what you're going to see and where it's going to be. So take this and uh, put it to the south 
east. Okay, right about here. And this is the sequence in about the spot that you're going to see it. Because the sun is going to be moving. <coughs> is it? Yeah. Who's moving it? Well, we're the Earth, right? <laughs> so we are moving, but it makes it look as if the sun is moving up, right? So during the eclipse, it's not going to be all in one place. It's going to start uh, lower down to the left, and it'll end a uh, higher up to the right. Okay. So as it starts, you'll see the moon starting to come in and take a chunk out of the out of the sun. And then it'll grow and grow and grow until finally it completely covers uh, the sun and you get totality. And then the other hour and a half is the exact opposite as the moon moves off of the sun and it comes back out. So as far as photography is concerned, it's moving. <laughs> you can't just set your camera up and go click. No, it's going to move across as it, as it goes. So you have to take all of that into account as well. The only thing that's not very good about this uh, particular slide is that uh, the intensity of the light is, is way off. Everything that you see in yellow is the full sun. It's going to be as bright as, as the full sun. It's not until just before totality that it'll start to get dark. Until that time, it's just as strong, just as powerful, and just as dangerous to look at with your naked eyes. So, in this picture, you would actually not be able to see any of this unless you had your glasses on okay, or special equipment. Once it comes to totality, if you have your glasses on, you're not going to see anything. You need to take the glasses off, and then you'll see this pearly glow, you know, the corona, the sense of corona. Okay. This is, um, has anybody else seen a total eclipse? Maybe you can verify this too. There's something called Sperling's Law that any of us that, that uh, chase eclipses and things we know is firsthand. It's the eight second rule. And that is no matter how long the eclipse is supposed to take, for us it's two minutes, a couple uh, uh, years ago in Mexico it was almost six minutes, doesn't matter. It feels like eight seconds. Everything is going to happen. It's so overwhelming, so beautiful. <laughs> That is going to go like that. So again, back to that camera, fiddling and trying to find the sun to take your selfie with. <laughs> it's eight seconds, poof, gone. <laughs> Figure that it's going to take eight seconds to make it worth it. And I just love how he, uh, how he puts this. You know, I'll read that to you. It overwhelms the senses and the soul as well. The curling doom of the onrushing umbra, that's that inner uh, blackness of the, of the uh, core of the shadow. The other world in pink prominences, uh, I'll show you an example of some of those. Those are little flickers of flames that come off the top and the bottom of the sun. The ethereal per pearly corona that you'll be able to see during the totality itself. The world is darker, oranger. Shadows look queerly sharp edged, and I'll show you an experiment that you can do with that. There's a nip in the air, birds are on Twitter. Shadow bands go skidding around, and I'll talk about the shadow bands too in another slide. The ominous umbra sweeps in. <laughs> the corona unfolds, the diamond glitters, and I'll show you that, and it's extinguished. Okay, what was that talking about? <laughs> okay, the majority of the time it's going to be like this, with the moon slowly taking out you know, a, a chunks of the sun as it moves across. Just before totality, uh, the last piece of the sun it's going to glare out like this. We call that the diamond ring. And then it goes away. And behind the diamond ring, just as it fades out, you're going to see a lot of these beads. And these are called baby's beads. And they're going to dance along the horizon here of the moon, uh, just for like a split second before it goes away. And you tell it ensues. That is sunlight coming through the valleys between the mountains of the moon. It's totally awesome. This over here are some solar prominences that we just talked about in the last slide. So you might be able to see this as well if you have good if you have good eyes. Remember again the size of the sun is going to be that size. So to see some of these things would be a lot easier if you could magnify it in some way. And I'll show you some examples of how to see it.
But were we wearing glasses? No, at this, at, right when you see the diamond rings start to fade, take them off. That's okay then. Right after the diamond ring. Just as, as a, this is part of the diamond ring. So it starts to fade. Take your, that's the time to take your glasses off and watch for these and also these. And then from here is fast going to go into this. Okay. And you'll see this corona coming on. It could be like this. You could be have pieces that go far, far off into space you know, as well. So it might be much larger than this. Depends on, on uh, what's happening that day of the sun. After this, when the moon starts to move away, you'll have the Bailey's beads on the other side, followed by the diamond uh, ring effect, and then you better put your glasses on. <laughs> okay, so the diamond ring effect is when you know you can take them off or put them on. So, the penumbra, that's the outer shadow, and anybody that's in the penumbra, including before it gets to you, what you're looking at is the partial eclipse. This is the moon not completely covering the, uh, the sun at this point. So you're going to watch the sky go from blue to purple to gray. Think twilight, only with a difference. Normally, twilight approaches from the opposite side. And then when it gets over you, it just slowly keeps going all the way to the other horizon. But in this particular case, twilight's going to come the other way. And when it gets close to you, it's going to wrap around you. Because remember, sunlight is 30 miles that way and that way, and this way and that way, right? You're in the shadow of the moon. So it's about 60 miles wide. So you still have light off in the horizons. So you'll have this twilight wrap around you. Pretty cool. The umbra is the, uh, uh, the inner shadow. This is totality. You'll see the beads. Here's a, a little bit better example of the beads. And again, these are going to dance along the horizon as it goes through different valleys and, and, uh, and covered by different moments on the moon. Also, you'll be able to see the corona, this pearly white uh, wispy glow that's going to come out there. And the stars and the planets are going to be out as well. So, when this happens, look uh, pretty close to the sun. You should be able to see Mercury. It'll be one of the brighter stars out there. The brightest star or star appearing. The brightest object out there is going to be Venus. And then off to the side for a little bit, you'll see another bright object. Third brightest object should be Mars. Sort of a ruby red, you'll be able to tell that. And something else. Now, this is difficult for me. I'm an astronomer. I'm going to take a tentative step over into astrology, so excuse me. <laughs> the sign that you were born under, that's the, that's the house of the sun at that moment. The house of the sun is what zodiacal constellation the sun is in when you were born. So if you were born in August, you are a Leo. Leo. So that's the constellation Leo, the sun should be in. You'll never be able to see that in your life because the sun is in that constellation, it's bright, you can't see the stars, it washes it out. However, the sun's going to be blocked. And it's gonna be in Leo. <laughs> so what to look for? Leo, the distinctive features of, of Leo in uh, the constellation is this big backwards question mark. And the sun will be at the, death, the point at the end of this uh, question mark. So when you see the total eclipse, Mars is over here. Uh, Mercury's down here. I think it's over here, so I don't see it. But um, so here's Mars right in the, in the center of this. So watch for this big question mark made by these uh, stars, and that's Leo. So here's the first time you'll be able to see, if you're Leo, you'll be able to see your own constellation. Okay, enough of that. Back in astronomy. <laughs> I mean, <okay. laughs> what to do? Well, definitely watch. There's a lot going on, not just in the sky, but around you as well. And be aware of these things. And that's another reason why you shouldn't be filming with cameras and other equipment, etc. You know, let's put it this way: ten years from now, you know, what do you really want to remember? Not seeing the eclipse, totally missing it, and having really terrible photographs, <laughs> or having these memories of this fantastic event. You know, so, 
put everything down. They have two seconds. I, I uh, condensed a Sperling, a Sperling's law to two seconds instead of eight seconds because <laughs> it goes so fast. Use the restroom before you get it. <laughs> and it's not that you can't hold it or an eclipse, but it's that you're going to be concentrating on other things. And there are things that are going to be happening that you can experience uh, with your body itself. I mean, there's a lot of changes that occur. So you want to be comfortable and relaxed and notice those kinds of feelings and changes that come out. Pretty awesome. Listen. Nature's going to hush. Animals are going to be confused. There's a number of other things, too, that are going to happen around you. And again, a grain of salt. These are all things that should happen, but they don't happen every time. But these are things to look for, you know, and notice. So just this awareness, just being aware of what's around you and what's happening, and feel it. There's going to be a chill coming across. As the sunlight is blocked, it's going to get a little bit colder. Okay. There could be a breeze coming up. Again, if there's a wind, you're not going to feel an increase in the breeze. <laughs> so it all depends on the situation and what happens that particular day. But these are things that can happen. And, again, there's a certain type of feeling that comes over, like an electric feeling. So if you relax and calm, not for with cameras, <laughs> you'll be able to sense some of these. It'll be a whole different experience for you. And safety. Now, um, how many of you have lit a piece of paper on fire with a, a pair of uh, a magnifying glasses? Or other things. <laughs> yeah, right. We've all done it. But the, the thing to understand is that your eyes are magnifying glasses. Just like that glass you held to start the fire, your eyes act as that as well. Okay? So you are, those are concentrating the light that's coming from the sun onto a small spot in the back of your head. <laughs> And concentrating that energy, potentially burning that spot. Okay. So that's number one. The second point to know about is the fact that the nerves in the back of your eyes, uh, we interpret that, our brains interpret that as light. So if you're damaging the nerves in the back of your head, you see that, you don't feel that as pain, but you see that as light. So you're looking at the sun, it's burning the back of your eyes, you register as, oh, that's bright. Well, of course it is, I'm looking at the sun, duh. <laughs> and you don't look away, I mean, because, yeah, okay. Nerves in your hands and other, and other places register as pain. So if you get too close to a fire or something hot, your brain goes, oh, you know, that's bad, move away. Uh, at least I hope your brain does that. <laughs> Right? But in your eyes, you don't have that. And the problem is that the damage that's done, you don't feel that as pain until about an hour or so later when things start to swell up and, and a lot of other things happen. Then you start feeling the pain. That's way too late. Okay. Now, all that being said, we do look at the sun. I mean, we've all looked at the sun, right? And hopefully we haven't done any damage. So, what's the big thing about an eclipse? The sun is not more intense. It's not any more dangerous looking at it then than it is now. The eclipse doesn't do anything to enhance the power. If anything, it's taking a lot of it away. Right? The deal is, it's sort of like the same thing with a tornado. You see this tornado coming and you take your video camera out and you stand there and it transfixes you. The thing is almost on top of you and you can't pull yourself away to go down into shelter. That's the same thing with this eclipse. It is transfixing, it holds you. So it's even more reason to be extra careful about looking at the sun. Can you look at the sun during the eclipse without the glasses? Ah, it's just like today, you go out and take, well not today, it's cloudy. But <laughs> you can go out and take a look for a second or so and then turn away. You know, it's the problem is that this is a very beautiful sight, a very unusual thing, and you're going to tend to look at it longer than you should. That's why you need the protection or different ways of looking at it. Glasses are a good idea. Be very careful with the glasses. You want to go out beforehand 
and uh, check to make sure there's no scratches or no pinholes or anything else where the light is leaking through. It should be completely black to anything except the sun. No other light should be able to come through this. If there is scratches or pinholes, rip them up and throw them away so somebody else can't use them. Or won't accidentally pick them back up and use them. These are not sunglasses. Sunglasses block visible radiation, the visible light that comes from the sun. The stuff that fire, that, that creates the fire is the infrared. That's down here, it's stuff you don't see. Sunglasses don't block that. Also, the things that give you sunburn are the ultraviolet. Those will burn your eyes. That's up over here, beyond the spectrum. Sunglasses don't handle that. They only take out this portion of the spectrum. These take out the infrared, the visible, and the ultraviolet. That's why these are so important. So you can put a thousand sunglasses together, you'll still burn your eyes because it's not blocking the dangerous rays. These will. That's why you have to make sure you have something like this. So over your eyeglasses or under? Yes, over. Okay. Yeah, because if you put it under, these are going to be concentrating a little bit of light too. I don't think it will make a difference in this case, but it's a little harder too, so it's much more convenient. It over. So in general, uh, for any optics, it always goes as the first element, you know, out in front. And I'll show you a couple of those first as we come along. So safety, yes, you can burn your eyes, yes, it hurts, yes, you won't know this until later. <laughs> so all of this compounds to make this sort of dangerous. Okay, now a couple other ways that you can do this. Most of these are going to be by what we call projection. In other words, you're not directly looking at the sun, but you're looking at an image uh, created by something that uh, you're using. The simplest one is a pinhole camera. And this is pretty close to what I did when I was a little bit kid. <laughs> okay. You take a piece of cardboard, and I had to put a circle there so you could see where the hole is. <laughs> and you hold that up behind you, the sun, be, you know, sun behind my back, and so this uh, behind, behind my back as well. Then I have another piece that I put a white piece of paper on, just so I can see it better. And um, you put this down, and the closer you have it to it, the brighter it's going to be, but the smaller it is. The further away you get it, it will make the sun larger, but it's going to be dimmer. So at some point, there's a, like a sweet spot in here where you can see this. The larger this piece is, the better, because it will shade this more, and we'll put the rest of this in, in, in darkness. And that's why I have a white piece of paper here to get a better contrast. And that's what you're seeing down here in the diagram, too. Now, there's a lot of effects uh, like this, what we call the pinhole effect. And I'll show you those in uh, a couple of slides from here. Another way to do it is with binoculars. And again, you notice they put a piece of cardboard here to put the rest of this in shade. Okay. And again, a white piece of paper that you hold down there. Now, the problem is, um, this is magnifying the sun's power again. So in this particular case, you wouldn't have the, the, the filters on, because you're going to project it on a piece of paper like this, not looking through it. But if I were to do this, I would have my hand down here on this. And I'd only do this for um, maybe 20 or 30 seconds at a time. What all of these methods are good for is the period of time before and after the total eclipse. During the total eclipse, you want to look straight at it. But before and after, you want to get a feeling for where is the eclipse now, how far along is it going, and then project this you know, on these pieces of paper. So again, because the sun's coming through here, this is going to make this hot. So you want to keep your hand over here, not in front of it, <laughs> but just on it. So if you start feeling it getting warm, turn that away. I have melted glass with this on a telescope. This is powerful enough to melt the glass. Oculars are very expensive. That was a bad lesson. <laughs> so be careful with that. So you can do this with telescopes as well. And I think that's on the next page. So you can take telescopes and do this as well. The larger uh, the piece of cardboard you have here, again, to cast a shadow, um, what you're doing now, the, 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 the more visible and distinct that will be, and the further that you can uh, bring that away. Once again, if you do do this, you want to hold your hand around the ocular section and just monitor it for getting warm, and then move it out of the way. And again, I would only bring this in uh, just for like 20 seconds at a time, just to see where we are, how it's progressing, and then turn it out of the way of the sun. 
tell you a little story. In Hawaii, we call it talk story. So I'm going to talk story for a second here. Um, the Mighty Keck Observatory. It's two observatories in one. Uh, they have some of the world's largest mirrors, 10 meters wide mirrors, huge, huge mirrors. They uh, need to do some work on the dome, and so they crack the dome open just a little bitty bit. Uh, the operator didn't do his math. A small ray of sunlight came down, hit that massive mirror, instantaneously flamed the dome. So started to fire up on the dome, instantaneously. So, yeah, you don't want to mess with this kind of stuff. But he doesn't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you another story about something else that happened later. <laughs> okay. Now, the other thing we can do is we can uh, put these same filters. It's basically the same kind of material that you have in the glasses. Uh, you can get, you can buy these. I'll show you a URL here in a little bit. You can buy these for uh, binoculars, telescopes, anything. And this is what I said before. You put these on as the first element out in the front, so nothing is magnified yet. And uh, these will make it safe so that you can actually look through, say, binoculars, like I have set up here, or uh, telescopes. Uh, in this case, for my camera, so I can uh, get a good view without destroying my camera. <laughs> So uh, you want to be able to get some of this. And again, the same thing. Before you use these, you take them out and you look through them and make sure there's no holes or scratches. And if there's any at all, you destroy them first and then throw them away. So you don't accidentally reuse them again and pick them up later. Photography. Well, first of all, don't do it. <laughs> but if you're a good amateur astronomer and if you're a good photographer, then there's a number of things that you, you can do. One is practice, 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 practice. The second is automate, 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 automate. <laughs> so that you hands off, just let it go. Some of the issues that you have are that, you know, number one, the sun's moving. So you have to have something to track this. Number two, the intensity uh, is differences is so huge. You know, naturally, between the partial eclipse and when you get to totality, there's a huge differential, like a 20,001 differential in the light that's coming through there. But even from the uh, diamond uh, ring effect to the Bailey's beads to the um, uh, corona, the difference in light is huge. So for a camera's point of view, there's a lot of different settings that you have to do. And this is happening, what, in less than a second? Need I say more? So it's a very difficult thing to do and, and to take, uh, uh, take into, uh, into consideration. Also, if you want to get uh, any kind of size of an image, you need about uh, 1,200 millimeters to 1,300 millimeters of a focal length. It's about this much. Anything shorter than this is going to be a small man or sun. This much on a 35 will give you about 75% of it covered by the sun. Good, decent quality image. So you've got a lot of these things uh, to figure out too. There's, if you don't like math, there's a website <laughs> where you can put in your camera, put in your lens, and it'll tell you how big it's going to look. You know, to figure all that out. Now, a good idea though is to have a video camera, because one of the nice things about a video camera is that you can take out individual frames, so you go frame by frame and find the one that you like. You know, bring that out, and also hands off. <laughs> okay. There's a couple other uses for a video too that I'll talk about. So some fun things to do. If you have a colander around the house you know, for straining noodles, right? It's got all kinds of holes in the bottom. That's like a thousand pinhole cameras. <laughs> so when you look at the shadow, you see the little bitty eclipses. Each one of those is a little eclipse, and it'll show you where the eclipse is now. You know, as, as it goes through. I'm going to skip this one, come back to that, because I'll cover all of them. Trees! All the holes in the trees between the leaves, those are pinhole cameras. <laughs> so look at the shadows, and you'll see all these mini eclipses. You see those? So watch for those. Like I see, there's so much going on around you, not just up above. You know, so look around. Be aware of some of these things that are happening. I'm going to come back to that one, too. And another one, 
take your hands and crisscross them, and with the sun behind you, put them up, up above and take a look at the shadow. Those are pinholes. <laughs> it's the same thing, especially for kids, that's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, now let's go back and pick up. Um, one of the things that uh, can happen, we don't know for sure if it's going to, but uh, something that happens every now and then, you might be able to see it on here, you see these bands? These are called the shadow bands. And they go skidding, skidding around <laughs> as it goes through. And we don't actually know 100% what causes that, but this is our current thinking. If you ever stand in a pool and there's waves in the pool and look at the bottom, you can see the, the, you know, the shadows moving back and forth. We think this is exactly what that is. Only it's at the upper atmosphere, uh, you know, above us. There's numbers of layers, but two of the layers that are high up above us don't mix. So it's just like the water and the air over the ocean. So the air up here is going fast, and it just pushes the bottom into these ripples and waves, exactly like you see it on the ocean. Okay, the same thing. Now, back to the mighty Keck. Uh, one of the times I was up there at the, uh, 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 the Keck, uh, I went through and, and took a look at their AO, their adaptive optics. This is what they use on uh, these huge telescopes to take out the uh, uh, fluttering of the atmosphere so that they get images just as crisp or crisper than the, than the Hubble does. The way they do this is they shine a special uh, sodium laser up through the atmosphere, and at that level, right where these ripples occur, that excites a number of the atoms and things up there that then light up. So it makes like a little spot, a little bright spot way up there, like a mini, like a fake star. They have another telescope that watches that, and watches how that moves around. So you've got the main big tech telescope. The light comes down, hits the primary mirror, comes in, hits the secondary mirror, comes down into the uh, coup de point, and comes across. And over here is where you have your instruments. One of the first things they have is a mirror sitting there. It's a very flexible mirror. And the back end of it, they have about uh, 4,000 little pistons that move back and forth and deform this mirror. And the output from that other telescope that's looking at that star feeds in to these pistons and will move that mirror counter to what's happening in the ripples up above. Looking at that mirror, you can watch the waves go by. It's really awesome. So, what we think is happening is that these are the waves that are up, you know, above. So the next question comes up. Why can't I see them today? Well, uh, well not here, but let's say someplace I'm studying. <laughs> How come they're not always there? And this and a couple other experiments will uh, uh, have the same explanation. The sun is not a point source for us. The sun has some diameter to it. So we're getting light from all the areas of the sun. So if you take a hair, I don't think you could take a hair, but something like a hair, and you hold it up there, when you get light from the different uh, areas of the sun, you get a shadow cast here, a shadow cast here, and every place in, in between. So it's fuzzy. Just before totality, what's happening? We've covered all but a thin part of the sun, and now becomes close to a point source. So now shadows become very, very crisp. And that's what we think is happening here. In your normal daylight, this is just all fuzzied out. Okay. But when you got a crisp point source coming down, you are now going to see these kind of ripples, uh, the same things that you see in the bottom of the pool, caused by our high atmosphere. Pretty cool. So take, what I'm going to have is a, I take a bed sheet and I'll fold it in half and put it down, you know, across there. And I'm going to take a, uh, a video camera and aim it at this because this is just before the, the, the diamond ring, the Bailey speeds and totality. So I'm not going to sit and watch <laughs> this, but I will take a look at my video afterwards and see if something happened. <laughs> so the other thing that I'll put uh, down there is the thermometer so that it can record the temperature throughout those three hours and see what happens, if it does dip. And uh, somebody in the, in earlier this morning uh, asked, um, is, is the dip going to coincide directly with the uh, 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 
uh, with totality. And as in most things in nature, there's like a hysteresis involved where it could probably lag. You know, so in other words, it takes time to cool it down, it takes time to uh, uh, warm it back up. So you might have the, the, the totality here, but uh, the cooling offset from that just a little bit. So it's some interesting things to take a look at. And then an experiment you can do as well. And the best way to do that is just to have a thermometer and a video camera looking at it, you know, and the shadow bands and whatever else you might have put out. So one of the other things is the shadows again, too. Um, it's going to become very, very crisp. And you're not used to seeing shadows this crisp. You know, again, normally your shadows look like uh, up here, very, very uh, fussy. But just before uh, totality, and just after totality, again, you have that point source. So it's going to bring that out and be very, very crisp shadows. Now, whether you can see an individual hair or not, I don't know. But it'd be interesting to at least try it. You know, another little experiment. Okay. Um, Kay came out with Kay Watt came out with a, a, a pretty cool one, and that is um, oatmeal boxes for a pinhole camera. So take a bunch of oatmeal boxes, take them together, take out the sections in between them, leave the end section out, put a pinhole in there, and then down at the other side. Uh, open a, a small square at the very bottom, put a white piece of paper underneath there, and now you have a very dark, long tube, so you have high contrast and a good image of the sun. You know? And again, this is useful for, you know, leading up to and after totality. During totality, again, you know, you want to sense what's around and book up. Well, that's a real cool idea. And I'm not going to go into this very much because that's what everybody's been going, you know, through. So I, mean, I put this in when I get my other talks. I had to spend a little time on, on this here. Here, I don't think I have to talk about that. So I'm going to skip over this. Um, Kay has some very good um, uh, uh, material down in Countdown to Eclipse. And it's .net, not org or com. So the finger members .net. Um, in particular, You can print this out, and this is pretty nice. But um, what this is, it's got two sides to it. One side there's a compass rose, so you take a real compass and use this to aim it at north. And then what it has is red lines to say where the eclipse starts, where the totality is going to be, and where the eclipse uh, ends. So you mark, you, you mark this down, find north. And then you can look over, so the azimuth for its starting is here, then the uh, total eclipse is going to be about here, and it's going to end there. So you'll be able to find it which direction it's going to be. And then the other side is the other kind of compass, you know, with degrees. And so now what you do is you use this, and with a little level here, and it's got arrows showing what the altitude is going to be. Okay. So you can line this up with your first direction that you found where it's going to start and follow the direction where it's going to start. So that's going to be over here and up about there. And then you can use this to find out where totality is going to be. So over here and then up about there. And so on. So you can use this uh, to go to your favorite spot and see if there's any buildings, trees, uh, Sasquatch, etc. in your way. <laughs> okay. And so it's a very handy thing. Of course, the time to do this is now, <laughs> you know, not on not on a Monday, right? That Monday. So that's a very good um, uh, thing to to use. Other things, um, all of these uh, filters can be ordered from that. There's a link on that site that'll point to this. A lot of the uh, uh, things that I just showed you, things to do, those all came from her website. Uh, so there's a lot of other ideas and things there too that you can look at. Uh, for things especially for kids too. You know what to do. So, um, can, can you go back? Yes. One, two, to the page you skipped. The one about what the she traffic and all of that. Oh, stuff. that one. <laughs> what if it's cloudy? Is there a, is, well, is there a depth of cloudiness where yes. it just really is it's just going to get dark, or is a thin cloud cover interesting? Yes. <laughs> yes, a thin, a thin cloud cover, you'll still be able to see it. And especially if you have any uh, uh, like binoculars or you know, projection, you'll still be able to, to pull that out. It depends on the, on the depth of the, you know, the cloud layer kind of thing. If it's completely clouded over, 
It's still going to get dark. You'll still have the feelings. You'll still have the uh, uh, things going on around you, uh, including the cooling down breeze if it's not a you know, mask or something else. So a lot of stuff is still going on. And uh, this is a question that gets asked a lot. And my advice is stay. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. There's no way. You're going to be able to get anywhere else. Why put up with the frustration? It'd be a lot less frustrating not seeing the full eclipse than it would be in a bunch of traffic, <laughs> gnarling at everybody. <laughs> so just stay where you are and enjoy and feel what's there. Because it's still, like I say, not everything is happening in your head. There's a lot that's going on around you too. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the thing to do in, in that situation. Okay, so, be safe. Watch all around you, not just up above. Okay. Listen to what's happening around you. Get the feel. It's going to be spectacular. One of the quotes, favorite quotes that I have is, is um, if, a, um, if a lunar eclipse, it sounds as if you a lunar eclipse is, is um, if, if, if a lunar eclipse is a uh, three out of a ten, then an annular eclipse is probably about a seven or an eight out of ten, and a total eclipse is a million. <laughs> and that's a quote from just about anybody that's experienced one of these before. <laughs> so with that, mahalo. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if, if there's any questions, let me know. And I'd be very happy to answer them. Well, one thing that I forgot again to show. This is a uh, this this is a solar telescope. It's one purpose only. It's only to look at the sun. And uh, remember that uh, red picture of the sun that you saw before. This takes away uh, everything, all the other light, except what's called the hydrogen alpha line. And it shows this. So this shows prominences and uh, other activity on the sun just in regular time. So you can go out today and, and use this and, and look at the sun and see what's happening. Which brings me to another thing. There's that sunspot is out today. Use those glasses. Go out and see if you can see it. Uh, my experience is that... Um, uh, six out of ten can usually pick out the sunspot with the naked eyes, that, with the uh, <laughs> with the solar filter on, but they can see it. Whereas you know other people, it's just too small what you find to do that. But you know, using your glasses today, go out, take a look. Well, okay, right, not yeah, today. I know. <laughs> go go a couple miles inland maybe, and <laughs> but uh, use the glasses. Uh, and I know a lot of people are usually surprised. You know, they hold their glasses up and they are absolutely black. And yet you put them up to the sun, and that light comes through. Right there should tell you something <laughs> about how powerful that is. There's some things up here, too, that uh, uh, from the University of Hawaii that you're welcome to take. Uh, this is my favorite, of course, because this is the Pan Stars Observatory. <laughs> and that's where I work. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. 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 What about cell phones? I'm picturing thousands of people. Yes, they're going to. Yes. Going to. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were. I'm probably going to degrade the network like crazy. So I'd imagine, are they going to see something in me? It's going to be very tiny. You know, even if you um, even if you take the camera with your regular lens on it, it's going to be a small sun that's in there. Even with a telescopic lens, normal telescopic lens, say 130 millimeters, something like that, it's still going to be a small sun. You need something about uh, 1,200 millimeters. That's about this. That's this length to be able to get a decent-sized sun on the back of your uh, your camera. So with the sun phone taken like that, it might look like it's just like the large harvest moon. It's going to look large and stuff. But again, <laughs> that's what it is. It's not yeah, yeah, it's not worth it. Definitely don't try to send it to someone. Yeah.